some of you will remember that we went to Hasbro and had a meeting with, uh, in which Vibo was one of the speakers. Uh, Tim Robertson, who used to be in Hasbro at the time, was he and I are the two who initiated that relationship, I think it's about 14 years ago. <clears throat> and every year for, uh, for 13 years, our executive MBAs went to Hasbro and spent a whole morning with the entire C-suite. It was delightful. And Viba has been part of the Center for Emerging Markets from the get-go. I remember the time when Viba and I sat and brainstormed on what the Hasbro strategy could be in the emerging markets. And since then, Viba has built Hasbro's presence in many of these countries. Uh, if you know from the bio, you can see that he you know, uh, started in Europe, uh, was the head of uh, Hasbro's North European and Central European operations, then moved to North America to Canada, then moved to the corporate office, then had responsibility for pretty much all of the emerging markets, and he's now chief uh, commercial officer at Hasbro. So he's also on the board of the Center for Emerging Markets and has been uh, from the very, very beginning. You know, we founded the center in 2007, and he joined the board in 2008. So a friend of the university, a personal friend, and a person who really knows emerging markets very well, and Hasbro is a company that was getting 70% of its toys from China. So I can't think of a more interesting person to invite up next. Viba, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Good morning, everyone. It, there's actually three links, Ravi. So the first link is Northeastern. Then there's a link with the Funk family, the Hessenfeld family. Hasbro stands for Hessenfeld Brothers. The Hasselfeld family has a long relationship with the Funk family as well. And uh, I think what Spencer said, they have two parts of the business. One part of the business is in retailing. And uh, the Fung uh, family enterprise has a stake in Toys R Us Asia. And Toys R Us Asia is, again, a customer from Hasbro. So that's the second link. And then my partner has an MBA in uh, political science from Northeastern University. So there's three links. So I'm happy to be here today. <laughs> so. Uh, I think you see on the chart behind you uh, the Hasbro logo and a number of brands. We have hundreds of brands, yeah, but you see on the stage here is a number of the brands where you're probably most familiar with. Monopoly, one of our oldest brands. Uh, the other link with uh, the Funk family business is Hasbro is almost 100 years old as well. So 112 years old, and I think we are 97 years old. So in a few years, we're going to celebrate 100 years anniversary. And I think the beauty of Hasbro as a company is that our brands, some of our brands are 90, uh, 80, 70 years old. You see some of those here, Monopoly, Play-Doh, Nerf, a recent, most recent brand, Power Rangers. And then you see uh, a brand which not a lot of people associate with Hasbro, which is a Magic, Magic the Gathering. Uh, it's a company we acquired over 20 years ago. They're based in uh, Renton, uh, Washington. And they have two key brands. One is Magic the Gathering, and the other one is Dungeon and Dragons, which you may know. And then uh, we have My Little Pony and Baby Life, Transformers, to name a few. So I'd like to uh, take you a bit on the journey of Hasbro's history in China and some of the challenges and opportunities we see. So a lot of the data here you may be familiar with, and I will target some of that related to what's important for Hasbro. We know a huge population, 1.4 billion. What's important for us, there's over 220 million kids yeah, in the range from 0 to 14 years old. Uh, I think what is good for us as an emerging market is a healthy GDP growth on an ongoing basis. The toy industry is $11 billion in size and shows a CAGR of 7%, which is very healthy for us. Uh, what is interesting is yeah, that year on year, the branded part of that industry is growing. At this moment in time, the branded part of the toy industry is around 20%. If you compare that to uh, Western European or a North American toy industry, 70% of the industry is branded. So that's a key differentiation. Uh, we also see uh, China as a digital first economy because we have eight to 900 million internet subscribers, yeah, and that clearly has an impact how we do business. And a bit later on in the presentation, I'm going to talk about that. Uh, you know, what is happening as well, it's a, it's a highly fragmented retail environment where we operate. So this chart talks a little bit about 40 years of Hasbro in China, and I'll take you on a little journey. So we started in 1977 with a small sourcing office in Hong Kong, and at that time Hong Kong was the manufacturing base you know, for toys and games, and most of our vendors factory were based there. And then in the 90s, yeah, we saw the shift going to uh, Guangdong province because of a lower cost structure, 
And if you look sometimes at chart, you see these circles, the circles becoming bigger and bigger yeah, from Hong Kong yeah, into mainland China. And into the next decade, yeah, we saw ourselves kind of moving further into China from a supply uh, chain perspective. What you see on the photo there is a uh, Transformers train, and that train runs every night. Yeah, we call it a milk run, and it gets the product yeah, from the factories into uh, Yanqian, the Yanqian port, yeah, from where we ship uh, goods around the world. Then in uh, the early 2010s, you know, we were to a point that we wanted to start up our own commercial operation. So we started a cooperation with a company called Kidsland. And then uh, in the 2012, 2014, yeah, we started up our own Hasbro China operation, which is a direct-to-retail model with our retail partners. So, you know, there's a lot of challenges from a macro and social political perspective. Uh, direct labor is one of the biggest cost factors yeah, in uh, manufacturing products for us. So when you see over the, over the last years, we see a significant shift of labor cost in China. In India now, the labor costs are a third yeah, what our labor costs in China. So in a few slides, I'll show you how we kind of transitioned our manufacturing base from a part, yeah, from, uh, from China to India. Uh, you know, we all watch uh, China trade negotiations yeah, very clearly. That clearly will have an impact on, uh, on our business and it clearly poses a risk. And I show you as well how we kind of shifted over the years from, uh, from a primarily uh, China manufacturing base to a more diversified base. Uh, and the other thing, as Hasbro is a, a play and entertainment company, uh, a lot of content uh, has you know, a certain level of restrictions going into China. You know, if you look at the movie industry, there's, I think, at the moment, there's 32 foreign movies can be aired in China. And clearly, uh, with tensions happening yeah, on the political level, yeah, it may not be as easy yeah, for foreign movies yeah, to be aired in China. And if you follow the box office of major movies a little bit, yeah, you see that now most movies have a bigger box office. Even American kind of, let's say, uh, indicated movies have a higher box office in China than the, ch than the box office locally here in the US. So from a sourcing perspective, uh, I think Ravi indicated, yeah, by in 2015, 80% yeah, of our manufacturing was happening in China, and that's being scaled down to a level of around 60%. What you see around the map, a number of countries where we diversified manufacturing in, we still have an, uh, uh, we get our games from uh, East Long Meadow in uh, Western Massachusetts that where uh, all our, our board games are manufactured. You see the Irish flag there. That's where our European board games are manufactured. We moved some of our Play-Doh, one of our oldest brand manufacturing, back into the U.S. as well. Uh, diversified into Turkey. Spencer was talking about Turkey. We manufacture Play-Doh in Turkey. We have uh, some manufacturing back in Mexico. And we clearly moved to India. We think uh, India is a, a really re reliable sourcing base for Hasbro as well. And most of our global retailers yeah, do DI business both from China and from India. So there's a, there's a really good infrastructure and high quality. What we also do, we do a lot of dual sourcing. So you know, we, have, uh, we have around 1,800 SKUs. So in high volume SKUs, yeah, we source the same product in India and in China. So a bit what uh, Spencer was talking about as well is uh, if we have, let's say, capacity for a million units of an item in China and we have the capacity for a million units in, uh, in India, what we will do now, move all that, let's say, demand for our U.S. customers to that Indian factory so we can, con can kind of forego yeah, the tariff impacts and we use the capacity we have in China for our European, Asian, or uh, Latin American uh, businesses. So what we also do, we localize uh, a lot of content. Clearly, uh, value expectations are different in some of these emerging markets. And then also, uh, some of you may be aware, if we manufacture in China, we need to get a product kind of officially out of China and then back into China. So uh, I think in the toy industry, it's, it's very common that you do local for local manufacturing, that you have contracts with manufacturers, that a product does not need to go out of China to import it back into China, but can be based in China. So those are some of the things, what we, uh, uh, how we diversified. This is a brand blueprint. Some of you may have seen it. At Hasbro, we have our brands in the center, and that's the IP of our brand. So I'll walk you to an example of uh, Transformers on My Little Pony in a second. We believe our company is 100 years old almost. Most of our brands are 
uh, close to 100 years old. So the only way to revive your brands and to make sure that your brands uh, uh, stay current is we need to get a lot of consumer insights, yeah, what are, how consumers want to experience our brands, especially in the digital age. And then if you look at the Transformers franchise, you have an Optimus Prime, if you have a Megatron, and what we need to do, we need to keep these, these characters to life, and it's the same what the Walt Disney Company does for, for their brands, we do for our brands, and that means storytelling. And storytelling can have a lot of different forms. I'm gonna show you a few examples on uh, filmed entertainment for Transformers, for example. It can be TV animation, it can be comics. And what we see at this day and age, a lot of user-generated content. So we have a Nerve Nation, and Nerve Nations are, I think it's almost half a million um, half a million Nerf fans yeah, who kind of film their own experiences with Nerf Blasters and they post that online. And that's a phenomenon which is phenomenal because these are fans, they're really engaged with our brands and they're the best ambassadors for our brands. Um, specifically for China, you see uh, underneath on this chart uh, what is different in China. Learning is key for Chinese parents. The, the key focus they have in development of their kids is not fun per se, of play per se, but is learning. So when we look at the uh, uh, toy and game product we develop, learning is a key element, also in a marketing me uh, message. Uh, Victor talked a little bit about e-com. We, we see China as a market where e-com yeah, has an enormous growth trend. If you look at our global business, around 20% of our business is done via e-commerce. And then you need to think about what we call pure players like Amazon or omni-channel players like Walmart, walmart.com, target, target.com. So it's around 20% in the US. If you look at Western Europe, countries like the UK and Germany, online represents between 35 and 40% of our business. A country like Korea is the highest at this moment in time. 45% of toys and games are sold online. And China is somewhere in the middle, around 30 to 40%. But we see that evolving even stronger for the future. And then what we do at Hasbro, we have our franchises in the middle, we have toy and game, we have consumer products. So uh, Spencer was talking about, about, about apparel, shoes, bike, backpacks, yeah, we have that for our products. Then immersive entertainment experience. We see entertainment has two functions for us. First, to communicate, do storytelling about our friends, our, our brands, our franchises and our characters. But at the same time, yeah, it's a way to, genera to generate revenue. If you have a brand like Magic, we have analog trading cards. We have Magic Arena, is a digital form where you can play Magic. But now we have also Magic on eSports, yeah? and people pay money yeah, to watch other people play Magic. So it's fantastic how you see the digital revolution of some of those games. And then we have digital gaming at Hasbro. We have two own digital gaming studios, but also we license, uh, you may have played the Yahtzee with Buddies. It's a mobile game. Yahtzee is a brand of Hasbro, and we get a license fee yeah, from uh, our partners who developed that game. So that's how you see how Hasbro emerged over this 100 year uh, period to a company which has not only as a toy and game company anymore. The first toy which was TV advertised was Mr. Potato Head. And the first game which was TV advertised was Game of Life. And I think it's phenomenal to see how over the journey yeah, where this, uh, this company gone through, how we kind of kept changing yeah, what we see as the philosophy of our business. And I think if we even look at 20, 30 years ago, there was a higher percentage of toy and game, and the more we move into the future, the more we see our, our company being uh, targeted towards digital, and it can be digital content, can be digital gaming, can be uh, consumer products, and always we have our base in toy and game. So here you see an example of the Transformers franchise uh, in, uh, in China. So you see toy and game here, you see uh, lifestyle licensing. Probably of any, comp any country where Hasbro operates its business and we're over more than 40 countries across the globe, you see there's a high desire and passion of uh, Chinese consumers to interact uh, with the Transformers brand and with Transformers characters. And the interesting thing is in the 70s, there was a Japanese content based on Transformers. So we call uh, consumers in China, we call kid adults. So these were dads yeah, who at that time, they were able to watch the stories of Bumblebee and Optimus Prime on television, but they did not have, let's say, the money to buy Transformers toys. They have kids now, and these dads are the biggest fan of Transformers, and they buy Transformers toys yeah, for their boys now. So we call those kid adults. And then you see digital. 
you see a lot of digital execution. I think the streaming of Transformers content, yeah, and even old content from the 70s, which we call Generation One, yeah, has the highest popularity in China versus any other country. And then you may have heard about, uh, if, if you're related to consumer products, it's called live entertainment. So what you see here is a number of executions yeah, that in malls, yeah, in theaters, yeah, people can go on a transformer journey. Or you go into malls and you go into an area where we can play uh, 3D transformers games. So that's a key area which is significantly kicked off in Asia and now developing across the globe. So here you see some images of 30 years of love for Transformers. Uh, as said, it was the first uh, foreign animation which was airing in China. And then we had the G1 animation launched in China in 1988. And then, uh, you know, that continued to go on in new experience for the future. Then talk a little bit about our movies. Uh, we had uh, six uh, Transformers movies. Um, the last one was the Bumblebee movie. Uh, was aired in uh, January uh, 2019, and our box office of this, our total box office for the Bumblebee movie was around 500 million dollars. And China was the highest-ranking country from a box office perspective, kicking in 170 million dollars of box office. So it's phenomenal. If you see the first movie, maybe our box office in China was around 20 percent of our total box office, but now China is the biggest market from a box office perspective. Let's see if I get this video to work. What you saw in the image, uh, that somebody can just tag uh, the image of Transformers and it directly gets you to Amazon, to Alibaba, or JD, where you can get your online purchases. So with technology in China, the way we can activate our marketing uh, is, is a, a very sophisticated level compared to a lot, of, a lot of other markets. So talk about new retail and content to commerce. Um, here you see the example of Alibaba and you see the example of JD.com. And sometimes a way to, to, to describe this, you know, I've been living for 15 years in the US. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, I uh, look up things on Google, I do electronic banking, I watch content on Netflix, on HBO, uh, I have my WhatsApp account. Everything yeah, which I have with these multiple uh, uh, companies in the US, yeah, in China, you're or in the Alibaba universe or you're in the JD universe. And that means that all that data, all the data which I consume on a daily basis is available. And uh, I was a few months ago, I was in the JD headquarters. And you're in a room like this where there's monitors on the floor, on the wall, and on the ceiling. And uh, so I got a question, OK, so you tell us what you want to know. And I picked up a city in the north of China and I said, OK, so what's happening from a commerce perspective for women between 25 and 30? And they see what searched, what content they watched, uh, what kind of items they purchased online. So the data availability is immense. And if we look at our e-com business, we center it around a number of data points. One is Amazon. Amazon clearly indicated they want to be in 100 countries. And I think Amazon developed a very sophisticated uh, go-to-market model, yeah, which we use globally with a global Amazon team. Then we look at the JD and we look at Alibaba because they are on the forefront, how they use data yeah, in, in driving commerce. And then we also look at smaller players that can be uh, Rakuten in Japan, that can be uh, Flipkart in India, which just Walmart bought a significant stake in. Can be smaller players in Europe like a Ball.com, because we want to make sure that however yeah, uh, key, uh, let's say, digital companies in the commerce space are using data, are using technology, are using content, how we activate that globally. The best example is voice. 
you know, voices clearly. I was, uh, I was traveling for Christmas, and I'm in the, in the lounge of Air Canada in Toronto, and there's this little four-year-old kid standing in front of the machine and says, hot chocolate. So the kid is so used to, sp to speech, to voice, yeah, is just standing in front of a machine and just saying hot chocolate and thinks yeah, that on, on, on that uh, command, yeah, he's got a hot chocolate out of a machine. So what, what we see in play is that you know, we, we are integrating a lot of play in the way we develop product. And as technology is on the forefront in China, especially we're going to drive that in our Chinese business. So here you have an, uh, an example of Transformers Bumblebee campaign in partnership with uh, JD.com. Uh, we have uh, teamed up yeah, with the Red Knight character, which is a character in the right. And what we created is a special Transformer. What we, what we created a special promotion, and we activated that with JD. I'm going to show you a little video. That's running. creating a new character, yeah, which is the icon of JD, and use that in partnership with, with Bumblebee and with Optimus Prime. And instead of taking examples, what we do with Amazon, what we do with Target, or we do with Walmart in the US, we're taking examples, what we're developing yeah, with our Chinese partners like JD and Alibaba, and we're going to take that yeah, to US and to European and to Latin America retailers. And we say, OK, this is how you do conversion. So for us, a phenomenal journey where data conversion, we feel that uh, our, especially our digital partners in Asia are far ahead yeah, of where we see some of our uh, North America or Western European partners. Remember last slides, data banking, we talked about that. I think uh, we just moved our media agency to a new agency in China because as all that data is available, it's much easier for us to, to reach conversion, yeah, to drive commerce in China than we can do it anywhere else in the world. And we're taking learnings from that approach in China and then uh, take these learnings and export that into, uh, into other markets. Offline retail remains very key as well. I think you know, we talk a lot about uh, the future of malls in the US or the future of malls in uh, certain countries in, uh, in Western Europe. And I think the mall uh, phenomena is huge. Uh, people love to go out of malls. Uh, and we do a lot of branded entertainment in malls as well. And we can have a lot of engagement with our fans into malls. So here you see some examples how our brands come to life at retail. And that's a little bit of the journey from Hasbro, both yeah, from a manufacturing perspective. Yeah. Uh, currently, in the US, 20% of what we sell is made in the US. Yeah, so we still made a significant shift. Uh, we still see China as a key source for manufacturing for Hasbro. But we're shifting to that to a much more diversified base. And the manufacturing capabilities we have in China, we use primarily now for countries where we do not have the, the tariff impact and with our diversification strategy, we still have an impact. Yeah? And you know, on, if there's a uh, toys is in category four, so that will, if these plans come into place, 
that will mean a 25% tariff impact yeah, for our goods. So you know that may result in a 10, 12% price increase yeah, for the prices what we need to charge our consumers on those goods which are impacted. And then you have some of our games product where you have some components yeah, which are sourced out of China, which Spencer was talking as well. You know, then we see what is that impact on the on our end price. So. That's one, that's a sourcing perspective. And then China is a consumer market for us. Uh, market is different from consumers, more focused on learning. Uh, not all IP is relevant, but when IP is relevant and transforms is probably the best example. The, uh, the power of a franchise like Transformers is unlimited in a market like China. So we see China as a uh, key consumer market. We see China as a key sourcing market. But clearly, there's a lot is, uh, is developing and on the move. And with that, I'll maybe open it up for questions. OK. Um, just wait a second. Nope. Do you want me to go ahead? Um, short, what crisp questions so we can get as many in as possible. To what extent do you believe virtual reality and augmented reality has a space in the Hasbro toy universe of the future? Oh, it has an enormous enormous role, and especially with brands like Transformers, brands like Nerf, brands like Power Rangers, brands like Zoids, especially boys' action brands, yeah, we see a clear role. Yep. Um, if labor costs are significantly lower everywhere else in the world than the U.S., why do you still have manufacturing in the U.S.? Um, you know, if you look at the, for a reason, yeah, we have our board game manufacturing. Uh, board games are primarily bought yeah, in the fourth quarter yeah, by having factories in, in this case, in East Long Meadow here, and factories in Ireland. Yeah. Our lead times yeah, from factory to, uh, to, the, to our retailers and to our consumers yeah, is a matter of weeks, yeah, and we kind of miss the six to eight weeks yeah, of a uh, of cargo freight, the, the, the shipping time from, from China to here. And then, um, you know, if you look at the product line like Play-Doh, Play-Doh is a brand uh, slightly under $500 million for Hasbro. Let's say half of that revenue was done in the US. So we have higher sophisticated products which we make outside of the US. But you all may know the Play-Doh cans, you know, that is something where we drive a lot of volume that so we manufacture the cans here in the US in the highly automated factories, yeah, and then a more complex products getting from China. Lynn? Over there, over there. Hello, over there in the back. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm trying to resolve what Spencer said that um, from the perspective of the middleman, um, sort of topping out at 20% of the e-commerce across all the categories, obviously, in his world, um, and yet you seem to be indicating that there's a, a much bigger growth for online. And looking down, what do you see that for, for toys and for Hasbro in particular, in terms of the role of the online in particular? Yeah. You know, if you look at, I think, online, the categories which are, have a high percentage on online, if you look at uh, all the big play sets you have in the back of your garden, trampolines, etc., I think the level of online is 70% for that category. If you look at the uh, you know, exercise machines, I think it's also 70%. So I think books is significantly higher yeah, than where the toy space is, 20%. And then um, you know, in Latin America, online is at the moment 5 6%. Yeah, so it's lower yeah, because people still like to go to malls, go to stores. Uh, and I think the more sophisticated yeah, the retail models are in specific markets. And I indicated Korea because I think it's fascinating to see that it's 45% there. And I think, you know, probably it will stop somewhere around 50%. But, uh, you know, what we've seen in the U.S., and I think Walmart has done a phenomenal job by the whole pick up and store model, you know, a big base of, of uh, Walmart customers do not have credit cards, they have debit cards. So it's difficult for them to purchase online and to pay online. So they order online, but pick it up in store. And I think two thirds now of all Walmart stores yeah, have, the cur have the curb service. Yeah, so you just drive in and you, you pick up your merchandise. So I think the model is very fluid. And I think you know, it's fascinating how Target and Walmart yeah, is using their stores as distribution centers. And so it's fascinating to see how it keeps evolving. Uh, 
I promise I won't talk about risk. Uh, you mentioned 80 to 60 percent was the scale down in China. Yeah. How has that affected your bottom line? Um, you know, what we do, I talked about dual sourcing. And so with dual sourcing, you know, we're in a negotiation position with our vendors you know, because we have quotes from a number of vendors in India. We have a number of quotes of vendors in China. We, not, we do not own you know, our own manufacturing, you know, so we outsource and our contracts are 18 to 24 months you know, for a product. So it gives us a lot of flexibility. And there's certain, you know, if you look, it's, it's, if you have kids, yeah, there's a high level of differentiation and automation for certain toys versus other. When there's a lot of, uh, let's say, technology into a toy, yeah, we still get a very good price out of China. Yeah? But the, uh, the less technology and the more labor is involved, it becomes more interesting in Vietnam or in India. Uh, it's favorable, yeah. If you move more to India, it's favorable because labor cost is a third of it. But there's a balance. And, you know, I think what Spencer talked about as well, there's quality, there's speed, yeah, and then there's the cost of labor. Yeah. With, um, when Toys R Us closed, major toy retailer, right, uh, how did that affect Hasbro, and was there a major shift in strategy? Yeah. You know, it's, it's uh, probably, I'm 32 years with Hasbro. It's probably one of my interesting journeys, yeah, what happened. You know, Toys R Us went out of business in the U.S., in Australia, in the U.K., and then the businesses of Toys R Us and other markets, yeah, were sold by other retailers. So in Asia, uh, um, it was sold yeah, to, to the lenders yeah, of Toys R Us, and uh, uh, the Funk family had a share in Toys R Us Asia, and they still have. So what happened in markets where Toys R Us went out of business, like the three I mentioned, uh, the US, the UK, and Australia, you know, you, you have, uh, there's a lot of inventory at Toys R Us. We were always joking, yeah, and Amazon wants five to seven weeks of inventory, and I think part of the Toys R Us problem was they have these huge spaces, yeah, all filled with goods, and Toys R Us would have 24 to 26 weeks of inventory. So imagine all these stores now, so over 600 stores are going to close. There's all that retail inventory, which is going to be, you know, they start with a 20% discount, they went to, to 30, yeah, up to 90% uh, to discount at the end of the day. So I think what it was unprecedented, what, what that would do, yeah, so when the Toys R Us stores started closing in, in April in the U.S. last year, so um, NPD and Nielsen, they did a number of studies, and they thought, okay, a number of these stores are consumed for, uh, for immediate gifting, yeah? and then some are used for birthday parties two, three months in a go, yeah? and then probably by the end of uh, August, yeah, the last stores closed in June, you know, all that inventory is gone. I think what we saw in Q4 last year, there were still a number of consumers yeah, who purchased toys for a discount, uh, put it in a closet, and then used it for Christmas for gifting. So it was kind of unprecedented for us. We talked about share recapture, so who's going to recapture share of the Toys R Us consumer. And it's interesting, Walmart picked up, Target picked up, Amazon picked up. And then there's, there's a type of retail where we had a small business before, and now we have a significant part of business. Ones are called, uh, Best Buy, uh, uh, GameStop, so Toys R Us had a big fan base, yeah? so f we call them fans of all ages, yeah? so that can be a male or female from 15 to 25, but also kids who are really into a franchise, who are really into Star Wars franchise, are really into the Avengers franchise. So Toys R Us had the biggest selection of toys. So what uh, GameStop and Best Buy did, yeah, they really focused on the fan consumer, and they picked up yeah, a big part of the fan business, which was lost at Toys R Us. Then Amazon or you know, online fan retailers like uh, Entertainment Earth, they picked a, a, a big piece of that up. And then the mass piece of the business well, was picked up by Walmart, by Target, and by Amazon. And then you have the value accounts. I think it's the most fascinating part of, uh, of retail as well at this moment. One is e-com, and the other one is, uh, is value and convenience. If you go to, uh, have, don't know if you have been shopping at a Five Below or in a TJ Maxx, you know, these stores have really transformed they picked up yeah, a lot of the, the daily traffic, yeah, what a Toys R Us might get, is picked up at that type of retail. So overall, it may take another year, yeah, but we always say, okay, when we look at 2020, uh, that probably has the best comparison to Hasbro's U.S. business in 2017. So you have these kind of two years in the middle when a conversion takes place. But the fact that Toys R Us is going out of business in the U.S. will have no impact uh, that uh, consumers buy less toys. 
Uh, can you speak to the imp implications in China of this uh, U.S.-China trade war? Because uh, you mentioned they may restrict the number of movies that can be allowed, foreign movies. And your products are sometimes very heavily tied to movies. Yeah, so what we've, what we've done, uh, when we look at content creation, so I think the success of Hasbro is the end, is the end of the day is defined of how, how good we do our storytelling. Because how good we do our storytelling means that our brands yeah, keep active and we keep a phenomenal engagement with our fans, with our brands. So we've been working with CCTV as the state broadcasting company on creating specific content for, for Chinese consumers. And uh, we're going to launch this year a Transformers Nezha series, yeah, which is uh, Hasbro Studios worked with CCTV yeah, to create that piece of content. So I think we've been seen as a company which is really engaging yeah, with Chinese culture and with Chinese broadcasters. So that's why I think we're at a slightly different a playing field yeah, than other companies who are depending on uh, on content. But clearly, I think every time we see something happening, which is happening here, that will have an impact on the fact how accessible yeah, Hasbro content is on streaming services. Or I think it will have in the short term an impact of you know how many foreign movies are allowed into China. Or then not only if they are allowed in, but also the time frame they are allowed in theaters. Because at the end of the day, the normal factor in the U.S. theater is that as long as box office is generated, yeah, a movie will stay on the screen. But in China, it's really, you know, the Chinese government is having a, a key say in the window how long a movie is at. So that will have an impact. Do we have time for one last question? Joe? Uh, wait, 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 wait for the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so kind of going along that point, um, have you begun to see a lot of Chinese look-alikes? I guess, do you see a Bumblebee, a Chinese version? Uh, and then also, are, th are there any steps that you guys can take to kind of counter that? Yeah, you know, in a way, in the digital area, it's kind of easier to attack it than before. So if you imagine a country like China, you know, a, a population of 1.4 billion, so there may be, let's say, visible retail stores, but a lot of retail stores around the corner as well on in small alleyways. I think in the digital area, it's much easier for our legal team yeah, to find these yeah, because you know, we have all these systems in place that they, they pop up. So, and we have a very, very active approach uh, to look at, uh, at uh, you know, we call it look-alike or knock-off products. And clearly it's an issue. Uh, we're working very closely with our, uh, our offline and our online partners yeah, because at the end of the day, it's in their interest as well that is not, let's say, unlimited access because at the end of the day, that would really impact the direct relationship we have with them as well. But it clearly is an issue and a challenge. All right, I'm afraid our time is up. Uh, Biba, thank you so much for a fascinating talk. My pleasure.